Uh, okay, if there's a 700 pound coyote, I'm never going around the area. <laughs> and he said, what? Buffalo. Okay, the bison, we had an eastern bison, but that didn't make its appearance until after AD 1500. And the western bison, you know, millions and millions, this was the eastern woodlands with pockets of prairie. So they could not have survived here with that. Elk was the third game animal. And they would have used a spear and a spear thrower. And with the spear thrower, you have the knock at the end of the spear thrower and a dimple at the end of the spear. And you put the two together, and this is not made for this, but you would throw it, releasing the spear, and it would create so create a 400% increase in velocity. So you don't have to stand right next to it. You can stand away from it. And when they would uh, make their lashing, you, ever, you guys ever hear of sinew? Okay. What is sinew? It's the muscle, ten, like, you tear it apart once it's dried. It is the muscle lining and tendons of the animal you're hunting. This is the back strap of a deer. And uh, it's in between the layers of meat. And you have to literally fillet it off. And then you can see all the lines inside it. After you dry it, you then do this to it and you work it. And this becomes the <coughs> string that is attached to the spears. And they would use rawhide for hammers. Now again, the, uh, the, uh, the Hopewell culture did not have grooved hammers. They had celts, but they did not have grooved axes either. Uh, but they would use the rawhide. And then the Hopewell cultural people also used, go ahead, gourds. Now, again, gourds start with the archaic culture. The problem, this is not food. So they would plant this. Can you imagine finding this growing wild? And you've got four of these. Well, once it dries, you can cut this open. You can use it as a container, whatever you want to use it for. You can eat the seeds. But if you plant them, then you can have more of Mother Nature's resources. This was developed uh, before pottery. So the Adena culture made the pottery first, and then the Hopewell culture made it into a fine art. Uh, we have fleshing tools. Now this is the deer, uh, deer leg bone. This would have been near the knee. This is the same area, and it is a fleshing tool. They would uh, cut this open, and they would use this then to flesh the, for the hide. Speaking of hide, you ever hear of brain tanning? No? You have, this is the brain tanned hide of a deer. And what you do is you kill the animal, you remove the brain, and you also remove the bladder contents, and you mix the two together. The brain matter, you mush it up, you put the bladder contents in. Oh, you ought to hear fourth graders at this point. They're just <laughs> grossed out. Um, and I will tell them, you take the bladder contents out, and then I said, then if I've got the right group of people, I said, how many of you have ever forgotten to flush the toilet at night? And you know, Ew! imagine sitting and having this, the hide in that for two days. Mm. You know, and then they pull this out, and then they stretch it out, and they use this fleshing tools to flesh the hide. And then, uh, uh, let's see, sorry guys, I gotta share a story. There was a grandmother that came to the museum when we first opened it up. And in our traditions, if we have a person that is visibly aged in years, uh, we would call them grandmother or grandfather, not using their, their first name. There was a grandmother, about 85, 90 years of age, and she had asked if I'd ever heard the Cherokee story of brain tanning. And I said, well, I've heard Cherokee stories of brain tanning, but I haven't heard yours. She said, that's right, young man, you have it. Come here and sit down. So she tells me the Cherokee story of brain tanning with the emphasis that if she tells me this story, I'm then obligated to tell other adults. Would you be willing to do that? Yes, ma'am. All right. This is the Cherokee story of brain tanning. Grandfather has given to man just enough brains to tan his own hide. She got up and walked out. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. Got it, finally, didn't you, Dusty? Yeah. Uh, baskets of wood. Uh, this is birch, but in Ohio, we would have used tulip poplar. And then uh, you've got all different types of uses of gourds. Uh, the dipper gourd, we call it, but that's just a long handled gourd. Anything longer than about two feet is not native to Ohio or to the United States, you got the long handled. Those are all South American and Mexican words. Uh, got dippers here as well. Do you guys know the story behind the Adena pipe? I don't, I'm not sure I do. Tell a really? story. Yeah. Um, the, the original's made of stone, uh, Ohio pipe stone from the Portsmouth area. I talked to the great, now whether he was fabricating some of this, I have no idea. I was talking to the great nephew 
of the man who found this thing. And uh, it is a statue of a man that is about this tall. And in the native oral traditions, there's no view of handicap or disability. It's just a difference. And if you have somebody with marked differences, you can see the disproportionate nature of his torso and his legs. And if you have somebody with such a physical difference, the spirits, the supernatural powers might be within this gentleman and he would become in such high esteem, he became the religious leader. Now, the opposite, if you have somebody with a mental difference, I have a nephew with Down syndrome. He thinks like he, he's 29 years old, thinks like he's about three or four, maybe five. And uh, he has been blessed by the spirits to only see the good in the world. He's been blessed by the spirits to only see the good in you. And if you were to harm the village, you wouldn't harm him. You would take him, kill everybody else if you wanted to, or take him for slaves, but my nephew you would take into your village and adopt him into your village. Not just one person. Might spend the night at your house one night, your house the next night. And then if your village was attacked, he would be picked up and taken to the next village. Everybody knew that if he was harmed, the spirits that allowed him to only see the good would be released and seek revenge on those who harmed him. So this is mixing some of the oral traditions in with this. So. Uh, some of the plant foods, about 50%, 45 to 50% of the food of the Hopewell culture was complex horticulture. And we have, uh, let's see, this is maygrass, or no, excuse me, uh, goosefoot. This is sumpweed. This is little barley. And this is a red knotweed, or is that vice versa? Anyway, yeah, this is a red knotweed, yeah. Uh, but this is what they would farm as for domesticated crops. Now, question, how do we know that they had that type of food? You. <laughs> you get sorry, I forgot your name, Jerry. Uh, Other than Ryan, my son-in-law, I can remember. <laughs> All right, seeds are so small. How can we find a 2,000-year-old grass seed? We take everything from the ground, goes from the ground to the bucket, from the bucket to the screen. Anything smaller than a quarter inch mesh falls through the screen into the back pile of dirt. When we're in a hot spot, we take a sample of that soil and dissolve it in water, called water flotation. Light fraction floats to the top. Heavier stuff, you got a screen in the middle of that drum. Um, and all the stuff that's heavy goes to the bottom. The mud washes away as the water. And, uh, we take a guppy net, swish it around, look at it and let it dry, look at it underneath a microscope, and we can identify what's plant, tuber, uh, or uh, uh, yeah, a tube, tubular, uh, rhizome, uh, plant material, bark, wood, charcoal. Send it off to a paleobotanist in Pennsylvania, and she can tell us what the species was and its closest living relative. So that's how we're able to figure out what type of plant foods that they had eaten. Now this will also tell us the eco niche, what was the environment like around here as well. So that helps. They did a pollen analysis here at Fort Ancient and they found that from 100 BC, which is the time frame the site was originally built, to AD 900 was big stem prairie fields with heavy domestication of chenopodium around the ponding area. So that's kind of neat. We'll get in more about that as we go through. This is, when, when you go to the Great Circle, you're likely to hear, there were not trees here. Mm -hmm. And it's it's that process yes. that led to that conclusion. And it's D.M. Weimer, is that the person you sent it off to? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, and again, the reason we know <coughs> that there were, now, there were trees here, but it wasn't forested. Mm -hmm. There were trees. And I've actually found, when we used to have a water line through here and a water line break, uh, we'd take a, but before I got here, they'd just bring in a backhoe and start ripping it up. Mm. And then after I got here, uh, we'd get that same backhoe person, but we'd follow the, the four inch trench. Well, why are we doing it that way? We used to just dig it up. I said, no, you can't do that now, I'm here. And so we'd find the little yellow <coughs> trench and we would work from that. And I found a stain in the ground about that big. And it went straight down. I thought, I've got a post. And then all of a sudden, it just went out like that. You know what that is? It's a tree. Yeah. The neat thing, there was domesticate pottery, not ceremonial, but utilitarian pottery at the base of that tree root. And so that meant people were here. 
Now, were they living here? Were they visiting or what? Well, at Baptist, when I was going to college, this was called a vacant ceremonial center. Nobody ever lived in these ceremonial centers. Well, I called them up and said, I think people are living here. <laughs> no, no, people aren't living here. No, it's a vacant ceremonial center. <clears throat> and I have a garden that was uh, about the size of this, this room right here, a little bit smaller. The very first time it had been rototilled after uh, the other site manager left, and it was the same garden, I found 100 artifacts. But all utilitarian, it was crap, uh, burned limestone, shell, bone. It was their debris. Well, what would their living debris be doing here if they weren't living here? <laughs> so I called them up. I think people are living here. No, no, that's not, they're not living here. When we built this new museum around it, um, Dr. Bradley, no, uh, Bob Conley, a PhD candidate at the time, and he excavated the 100% of the footprint. And they found the remains of seven structures. And he calls them up and says, I think people are living here. Really? We had no idea. <laughs> and he just recorded that. Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're sending it to your yeah, boss. Yeah, there right, you go. Exactly. So uh, let's see here. Other things. Bone tools. Again, a bone, a bone awl used for punching holes and hide in leather. So these are the ankle. This is the ankle bone of a deer. And this is, again, that kneecap there. Uh, the Hopewell culture, have you guys been uh, uh, taught about the trading system? <coughs> okay, we're going to talk about that once we go through the other side. Uh, everything else is basically later on. So what we're going to do is we'll walk through the museum. We're not going to discuss anything up until we get to the Fort Ancient component, or the, the site itself. And then what we'll do when we get through the finish with that, we'll take you outside here to the Hopewell house and talk about that. that are 512 feet apart. And this is a recreation of what a Hopewell ceremony may have looked like. And uh, again, State Route 350 <coughs> cuts right through here, up, excuse me, going this way. And so it cuts through that opening just north, uh, or just uh, north of that little opening. Uh, and this is one mound, one mound here, another mound there, and another mound over there. And what they're able to figure out is by using the sun and the moon, they were able to document specific dates of the year. And again, those dates, we don't really necessarily know. Uh, we do know the summer solstice and the winter solstice. So they were able to use the site for <coughs> annual events. And then we're going to talk a little bit about where they would stay once they were here, once we get back to there. Now, that is kind of interesting because uh, uh, the mounds were excavated back in the 1890s and then rebuilt in 1894. Now, not the earth walls, but those small uh, stone-covered mounds, which is one reason why we can get away with putting a fire on top of a reconstructed mound. So we'll just walk. It's going to be, a, if I call this the meander, because we're going to be meandering through this thing for a bit. You'll also notice down here, I think, there's a lot of wastage. And that's what we study at archaeological sites, this wastage tells the story about how the ships... The museum is divided into three main themes. The first Ohioans is all in blue, and it takes in the paleo and the archaic cultures. The next theme is in a goldenrod or a yellow color, and it's tillers of the soil, and it talks about the Adena, the Hopewell, and the Fort Ancient culture. Now, uh, this is one of the remnants of the old museum. This was made in 1964 for the museum that was built in 1965 that we've en en enveloped. So this is where we're going to spend most of our time now. Uh, this is the a topographic map of Fort Ancient, State Route 350. I take it you guys came in from 71 to exit 36? That's right. That's right. So you came in this way, through the <coughs> twin mounds, through the earth walls. Now, we call Fort Ancient a hilltop enclosure. We're 245 feet above the Little Miami River, and we're enclosed by over 18,000 feet of earth walls. Uh, 18,000 feet, that's roughly 3.5 miles of earth walls. 
built 2,000 years ago by people that we don't know their true tribal ancestry, but we call them the Hopewell Cultural People. Uh, the term Hopewell comes from the landowner's last name on which 30 mounds or so were found back in the 1800s. So the Hopewell Cultural People, when they built Fort Ancient, they would have used nothing more than the shoulder bones of deer and elk, split elk, antler, clamshell, hose, digging sticks, placing the soil into baskets that we have demonstrated would have held no more than 35 to 40 pounds of soil. <clears throat> well, how do we know that? You guys, when you were little, fess up, you ever played a sandbox? A little sandcastle? <laughs> yeah. Plop all that soil in your bucket, turn it upside down, and pull it up, and you've got the volume of soil. Even after 2,000 years, we can see basket loading of soil. See, we have a half circle here. So all you got to do to figure out volume is to take your tape measure, measure the length of the stain, the depth of the stain. And again, give those measurements to somebody who got better than straight C's in high school, general math, that was me. And it gives you volume. There's an estimated 553,000 cubic yards of soil. Now, Brittany, what does that mean to you? That's Brittany, right? Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. What does 553,000 cubic yards of soil mean to you? Be honest. They had a lot of deposits. A lot of, yeah, yeah, okay. A lot of soil. A lot of dirt. I, that's all I'm asking for, guys. That's it right there. A lot of dirt. What's it mean in terms that you and I can understand? Get a commercial grade dump truck. Each dump truck holding 15 to 20 tons of soil, and you strip the earth walls away. Park it at the end of the Jeremiah Morrow Bridge on Interstate 71, and start parking dump trucks end for end. Pardon me. Is it clear to Columbus or something? Beyond Columbus. 20 miles from downtown Cleveland, 200 miles away. The radiocarbon dates assess a date of construction of 100 BC to AD 290. Now again, I said 100 BC, the pollen analysis substantiates that as well. 100 BC, this was all forested. They killed the trees. <coughs> so they couldn't kill, they couldn't cut down the big trees, they could girdle them. Remove the bark, it's like super gluing your mouth shut and you'll die of starvation. So, <laughs> yeah, see, so yeah, I, I'm a, by the way, it is an honor and privilege to talk to an audience who's greater than third grade. Thank you very much, yeah. So, but, uh, so the trees slowly die, the sunlight comes down, and they start building these earth walls. And so the tallest of the earth walls are 23 feet high over here, and the smallest ones are about three feet high here. How, in 1809, the earth walls that are 23 feet today were registered at 27 feet. We've lost four feet in 200 years. How tall could these earth walls have been 2,000 years ago? They've guesstimated up to 36 feet in height. So we're just going on what we know now. Who knows what it was like 2,000 years ago? So again, the kicker, we have one, two, three, four mounts forming a 512 foot square. Now you said you've already heard Dr. Bill Romain, right? Yep. Okay, uh, phenomenal person. Uh, he, did he talk about the Hopewell unit of measure? Yeah. Yeah, 1,026, something like that. This is almost a half unit of measure. Mm -hmm. So there's der der derivations of this um, 500, or, uh, 1,026 used in Ohio Hopewell. Accomplished engineers and mathematicians, able to make perfect squares, perfect circles, octagons. If you've heard Brad Lepper speak about the Great Hopewell Road, okay, and again, that's uh, some people debatable, but I like it. I think it's a, I think it's very plausible. And uh, so these folks came here, built the earth wall, and used it as a place to gather for religious. It's my phone. <laughs> uh, to gather for religious. So you heard it this morning, didn't yeah, you? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> To get, to I asked if you were sitting on a cat when I heard it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think, though, that was a, that was a test. It was the hawk. Oh. It was okay. a hawk at that point, yeah. I got outdoor calls. I'm an animal guy. Uh, but anyway, people would come from all over the region to Fort Ancient to gather here. Now, you guys don't live here. But yet, if you've come from Newark, are you going to leave after ceremony today? No. You're going to stay here outside of the earth walls, over here, Middleborough Road, where you guys came off the interstate, and then turn left or right onto 350. Did you notice the farmer's field over there at all? That entire field was a huge Hopewell habitation area. 
And again, the early archaeolo the archaeologists said that that was where the people lived who built this site. Well, kind of. I call it the Marriott, the Hotel Lake, the Holiday Inn Express. When people come to visit, they have to stay somewhere. So it would have been a huge area out here. Now in here, yes, we found houses. Uh, and again, mixing some oral traditions with archaeology, uh, the people that were here would have been the caretakers, the people that would be uh, living here year round. You know, like your churches have pastors and some of them live right next to the house. Your, your uh, money helps support their needs. Well, then people could come here and then they would help pay with things to live on and they would be able to stay here. So now, from this mound, where State Route 350, one opening to the left of 350 is the summer solstice. From this mound, and one, two opening south of 350, is the winter solstice. So summer solstice, winter solstice. Where State Route 350 comes through here, and the toll booth mound, is the minimum northern moonrise. You allow 9.3 years to go by, and it's one, two openings to the left of 350. You allow 9.3 years to go by, it goes back to 350, completing an 18.6 year lunar calendar. Kind of cool. Now, about three or four years ago, I was looking at there, at the, at the walls, and it's kind of interesting that the in between of these two walls here are almost the same length. We have an opening here as well, the summer solstice. I'm thinking that that might mark a five year calendar. I don't know if that's ever been, it's not, you know, but it just looks good. You know, it's not been demonstrated, it just looks good on paper, you know. So they're using the sun for annual events, they're using the moon for a decade of events. This is where it gets confusing. The Hopewell culture abandons the site, their culture ceases to exist. Any of you guys know what happened to the people? What about you, ma'am? What happened to the people? Um, I don't remember. Don't remember. JT? What? I think they migrated somewhere else, don't they? Yeah, nothing happened to the people. It's the culture that changes. When I'm talking to the little ones, I, I say, you guys got grandparents? Yeah. Okay, your grandparents could be the 1950s Bobby Sox culture where Mickey Mouse was God and Elvis Presley was king. I said that once to a Catholic school. The, the nuns did not like that very well. <laughs> yeah. And then the parents would be the space age culture. I saw the landing on the moon in 69, but the space shuttles in the 80s. You guys are the internet culture. You're still related to your grandparents. Just time and technology separates you. So there was a mound in Circleville that was excavated over 100 years ago. And the lady, about 15 years back, had DNA studies done on 36 people. Who would be the closest living biological relatives of those 36 people today? The Apache, they're not here. The Sioux, they're not here. But it is in the Sioux, um, um, uh, uh, oral traditions, they were here 2,000 years ago. The group called the Kickapoo, they're not here today. Yakima in Washington State. Chippewa Ojibwe from Northern in Michigan. So who were the Hopewell cultural people? Everybody in basically from the imaginary Interstate 70 down through Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, Kentucky. All of those people, different tribes, but practicing the same religion of burying their dead in mouths. That's all it was. So the Hopewell culture is gone. AD 800, 9900, a new cultural group of people come to the site and live back here. They live here, they die here. In fact, this area, there was a village and they know there was a village over here, but there's a cemetery right here. There is a stockade, part of it was found over here. That's AD 900, off and on until AD 1550 according to pottery seriation. They leave, 1798, State Route 350 is built, then called the Lebanon Chillicothe Stagecoach Road. Archaeologists come up, scratch their head, and say, gee whiz, what is this site? Gee, it looks like a fort built by ancient people. Gee, we gotta think of an original name for this <laughs> fort. Being an archaeologist, I can tell you we'd always, always hope, we don't always have the most imaginative of minds. So we called it Fort Ancient. They thought it was a place for warfare. However, the very first person, Caleb Atwater, just before him, and it was, uh, it was uh, excuse me, backing up, recorded in 1809, they thought that this was a place to ward off against mastodon attacks. 
Well, we know that ain't true. In 1820, Caleb Atwater, whether he visited or read about the site, he said, you know, I don't think this was used for warfare. It might be used for some type of running events and sporting activities. And then in the 1830s came known as the myth of the mound builders. Have you guys studied that yet? You probably have, right? Myth of the mound builders? Yes. Um, I've done some research on older archaeologists. Okay, the myth of the mound builders. Mound builders weren't even Indians. They weren't American Indians. They were ancestors to the Aztec, the Inca, or the Maya. Because everybody knows the Native Americans did not possess the mental intelligence to build these monuments of Earth. Imagine the lawsuits today. <laughs> so that became known as the myth of the mound builders. Also, it became another idea. Well, the American Indians killed off this advanced civilized race of people, so let's do it to them. That became some of the sentiment in removing the Native community. And the first man to do a systematic excavation of this site was 21 years old. And he undertook Fort Ancient as his very first attempt in archaeology. He succeeded in doing two things. Number one, destroyed everything he touched. That's what archaeology does. Number two, he made it the first state park in Ohio in 1891. The style of archaeology, though, I call it vertical archaeology. Get a shovel and dig a hole. And for every shovel full of soil you remove up here, you are literally removing over 500 years of history. So if you're digging straight up and down, how are you going to know what culture was here first and here last? In the 1930s, they stopped digging vertically. They started to dig horizontally. Question, how do you dig a flat hole? <laughs> Dusty, is it? Scrape it. Scrape it, okay, that's cool. How do you dig a flat hole? I forget your name, I'm sorry. Kara. Kara, that's it. How would you dig a flat hole? Oh, I don't know if I want you to answer that. You might know. <laughs> well, Go ahead. Well, earlier, survey survey. Yeah, but how do you dig a flat hole? You do. Everyone says that. Everyone says you don't. Ready for this? Get a flat shovel. I don't ask hard questions, guys. So now, now, you're right. Now you scrape it with that flat shovel. You're coming across what was put there last. You're finding it first. Layers of soil. Stratigraphy. I found a way to explain stratigraphy to third grade children. I said, if I tell you how to demonstrate stratigraphy, will you go home and show your parents? I said, yes. Good. All you got to do when you get home is take your parents into your bedroom. Look at your closet or under your bed and you'll see what layers of stuff really are. <laughs> now, I've raised three daughters. So, I, and I did this to my 15-year-old two weeks ago. I could not do this without stepping on something in her bedroom. <laughs> so, do you guys have bedrooms like that when you're in? What about you guys? Yeah, what about, no, no, yes, she well, did. I was Much younger. Uh, much younger. <laughs> See, when I was a kid, my family was known, as I said, that Northern Beverly Hillbillies. And I knew I wanted to become that archaeologist one day. And I did my own scientific experiment. Now, again, my mom, we'd always go to town <coughs> once a week, laundry and groceries. My mom's rule, when you get home from school, take your school clothes off, put your home clothes on, put your school clothes in the hamper. For a solid week, I put all my clothes in the closet. Yeah. You see it coming. And then my mom went to the hamper on Saturday morning, no clothes. Jack, where's your clothes? Mom, they're in the closet. Why are they in the closet, young man? Put my finger to my forehead. Said, Mom, I'm gonna be a future archeologist one day. Ask me what I wore to school last Monday. Now again, you're talking to a sixth grader that had already jumped out of the second floor window to escape his sixth grade teacher. Very <laughs> hyperactive. And so my mom says, okay, I'll bite. What'd you wear? Well, come here, Mom. Open up the closet door. Made sure she was right behind me. I had a mound of clothes. I reached in and how in the world, I just shouted out, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, two. get the point? Yeah, so I proved to her what was on the bottom was the oldest and on top was the youngest. You know what happened next? She proved her point. Didn't have the ability to sit down for 30 seconds. Gave the chance to leave my house for a week. So. Are there any questions about the Fort Ancient site itself? Okay. So that's going down just because of the river valley? Correct, uh, this is a topographic map and this so it's much flatter back here compared to exactly now the kicker why is state route 350 cut through here well if you look at the topography here it goes down 150 feet down to here yeah, it's almost straight right down there. in it yeah right there the gray uh yes the gray areas the the topographic maps going down right here look at this it's flat it's flat 
It is the only area. 99.999% of this site is surrounded by deep gullies and or the Little Miami River. This is the only flat spot. So when they built the, the roadway, they had no choice but to cut right through the earth walls. Now the kicker. Where my shadow was at here, used to be a huge gully. Right here was a huge gully. Right here at the stop sign is a huge gully here. Yet you're able to go from point A to point B. Yes, they built an equal amount of soil to build the earth walls was used to fill in three gullies. So that means now 400 miles of dump trucks. Yeah, wow. Now when you go back through the grounds, you've been to the Overlook before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to go with you over there, but when you leave, you're going to be turning left and going through. You're going to be cutting through right here at my dark shadow, two crescent shaped mounds. It's a funnel to go from point A to point B. You're driving through a 2000 year old trail. You're going to get just before you get to the stop sign that is here. Look to your right and you'll see a drop off that goes 80 feet below your seat. And then on this side, you can still see 30 feet down. So they filled in those three massive gullies. And then you cross over what we call the Great Gateway. And the picnic area is here. The road continues all the way to the end, and then you can get out and go to the North Overlook and view three and a half miles of the Little Miami River Valley. What is interesting is that if you look at the big bridge, that's the Jeremiah Morrow Bridge, it is one and three quarters of a mile from where you're standing. If you were to place our earth walls in a straight line, you're gonna see as far as you can see is I call it this butt ugly water tower. And you're gonna see that it's three and a half miles out, which is exactly the length of the earth walls placed in for end. Now, the other thing, there was this site had a blueprint for it. Now, and again, how many generations do you think it would have taken to build this site, even without, with the blueprint or without? The average life expectancy of a man was only 30 to 35. Sorry, ladies, 28 to 32. Average cause of death for men has always been conflict. Now that is not warfare. That is hunting accidents, an animal attacking, you know, breaking your leg or something else. Average cause of death for women throughout prehistory has always been childbearing complications. A 40% child mortality rate. Four out of 10 children never made it past the age of five. So how many generations from 100 BC to AD 290? That's 390 years. We're talking a minimum of 19 generations. Wow. 19 generations to build this site. So I've been able to trace my generations back, or the genealogy back seven generations. Can That's you imagine? Yeah. You know, to doing it 19 generations back is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Now, when they built this site, there was a blueprint right here. This was stage one, the green area right here. They had mounds of dirt there. They put the mound, these small caps of soil, so they knew where they wanted it. And then the second, was a large end here. The third was up here. Now, what is the biggest difference between stage three and stage two? And what would cause that? That's it, guys. It's erosion. Yeah. Can you imagine? Bring this in and give this third stage the same type of, of uh, outline. Because we've lost, again, three to four feet of soil, but right outside of the walls over here, that doesn't show it, was a trench that was 15 feet wide and eight feet deep. It's gone today. It was kind of like a borrow pit area. And so if you can imagine slumping and erosion doing this, but this wall is 23 feet today. That's right to there. So prehistorically, it could have been way up here. Kind of cool. Anything else you can think of, guys? Would they fill in the valleys that they have to change the drainage pattern? Or, I mean, was there naturally water flowing down the river? The That's a good question. And again, we, I can't answer that because I don't know what that was like 2,000 years ago. But where did they get the soil to build all this? Number one, directly below us. Our topsoil should be this deep. Our topsoil is eight inches deep. Number one, they stripped the topsoil away. And once you strip the topsoil away, what's going to grow? Not much. Not much. Yeah. Grasses. 
And also, Kenopodium, lamb's four quarters or goose foot, they call it, grows in disturbed soils. So they stripped away the topsoil here. Area number two, <coughs> as you drive through the grounds, you're going to see ponding areas. The early archeologists called them an interior moat system, an interior moat. So if you have an interior moat, it's on the inside of the castle. Have you ever seen a moat on the inside of a castle? No. Build a flat surface, as you're building a flat surface on one side, you're building a borrow pit on the other. Again, to, to the architects, it's a borrow pit. But to the native communities, it's not. It is um, very important symbology with the water and also the plants growing around it as far for farming. And then area number three, outside of the earth walls, when you get to the North Overlook, look down and you'll see um, a trail called the Eagle's Trail. There were three artificial trenches that were built there. They went 50 to 80 feet down and brought up soil to build the earth walls. Three areas, that's 500 yards long each. So 1,500 linear feet of, wall, of uh, soil was brought up. Why? Because that was their burial area. There were mounds down there on the terraces. So again, blueprint. They knew what they wanted. And so they built the terraces and they brought the soil up, completing the terraces to bury their dead. 2,000 years old. Anybody else? All right, what time do you have to leave? Roughly an hour and 10 minutes. Okay. So we've got some time. So what we're gonna do now is just step outside. We're gonna go over to the Hopewell House and talk a little bit about the, the living arrangements. We have over 200 gourds around the garden, uh, the fencing area and native tobacco that we still grow. Uh, corn, beans, and squash, the three sisters are over here. So we grow crops that were indicative of those that were grown 2,000 and 1,000 years ago. Now, the kicker. From this, uh, the, the big structure, when the museum was built, they excavated 100% of the footwork, we call it the, blue, the footprint, and they found the remains of seven structures. We took a composite of two of those structures and made this. We had 57 vertical uprights, and we had over six tons of soil used for the walls itself. Vertical uprights, and you can see saplings woven in between. And then we had three acres of prairie grass to make the roof. Now with us, not knowing what we were doing the first time, we used over 2,200 feet of baling wire, baling twine. Prehistorically, can you imagine the, how, much, how much the commodity would be for string? You would not put 2,300 feet. You'd figure out a way to do it without it. This, this structure was redone a year ago. We hired a fellow from, the, now lives in Cincinnati, lived in Ireland. He is the only professional thatch maker in the United States. Makes his living with thatch roofs. Guess how many <coughs> feet of string is used in here? None. Under 200. Under. Yeah, he strung the bottom row. Everything else is simply shoved in. We've had 80 mile an hour winds already. Look at this thing, it's perfect. Now, we normally won't go, don't go in here because it's so wet and we're in the middle of a redoing it. I'm gonna take you inside. Just watch where you're walking. You can tell it needs some renovation work yet. The wall's mainly clay based soil. Yes, uh, yeah, it's clay that is three to seven feet down and then it is mixed with the chaff from the prairie grass and a little bit of sand. And uh, we mix them all together. Now again, you can see the holes through here. Um, that's what happens when you don't have a good roof. The other roof came apart and it started to deteriorate. So we came back in, we redid the roof. Now this year, we're gonna be bringing in more soil and the Boy Scouts are gonna be putting this in. Now, I got a uh, question for you and it takes a little bit of its critical thinking. The original <coughs> fireplace was found where you're standing for the structure in there. We used to have a fireplace there. It was only 12 to 13 inches 
big, about a foot deep, but below that was another, it was an oven below it. So a fireplace and an oven. Why was it located there instead of in the center? Ventilation. Ventilation, okay, that's a good guess. Now again, ventilation, we would have had a chimney prehistorically. We did this intentionally because we're not gonna build a fire in here. And this would have been all capped. You would not have been able to see through any of this. Well, they would. They would uh, historically, yes, they would. Uh, they would fumigate. They would smoke it once a year at least, intentionally to get the whole thing in to kill the bugs. But yeah, yeah, the smoke would stay at about this level. <coughs> but why was the fire there instead of here? <coughs> Excuse me. Nobody. You got more room. More room, okay. If the fire, let's think about it. If the fire was there, what would that what would that fire help do? Heat. Radiating heat. So what the fire was over there, when do you think this structure could have been utilized? In the summer or in the winter? Summer. Summertime. Yeah. They didn't need the fire in the center. And as you said, more room and move around. That was a cooking hearth. It wasn't a heating hearth. <coughs> also, they didn't live in here. They lived outside. This is where they slept. And they would have probably had a loft up here as well. Again, we only know from the what we find physically in the ground. A feature is anything made by a person that cannot be taken into the laboratory. So a, a stain in the ground, a grave, a garbage, a garbage pit, a fire hearth, or a post stain. But once we get above this, it's all conjecture, folks. We've got evidence of wattle and daub. That's why we've done it this way. We've got evidence of prairie grass, because we see it in the wattle and daub, impressions of the prairie grass. Kind of cool. Now, <coughs> excuse me. We're in the process of redoing this on the inside. Uh, an Eagle Scout project made the first bench and that lasted for a while. The Dayton Society of Natural History, been a little, we've been a little slow <coughs> getting the people out because of a lack of um, help. But that area <coughs> behind you there will end up being a bench as well. And then we need to elevate this. When you get so many people coming inside it, it starts to depress down. So this retains water better than any other place in the entire site. <laughs> so that's why we got boards and stuff on it now. All right, we're all done in here. <coughs> Excuse me. Come on out. <clears throat> All right. Now the other structure you're looking at is a seventh or an eighteenth century Shawnee hunting lodge. How long do you think it would have taken for people to build that? A day. That's it. Yeah. It took 2,000 hours to build this from people that didn't know what they're doing. We had a fella come in by himself, and in eight hours, he had done most of this. And then uh, the bark. Do you have any idea what that is? It's not even bark, it's veneer. From an Amish, uh, from an, uh, an Amish woodworking place, they make veneer once a year. So this buddy of mine went to the Amish land and bought an entire truckload of veneer. <laughs> Tell me, it doesn't look like bark. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. And with inside, there's nothing to see inside here too much, but we'll open it up for you, just so you can take a quick look at it. Feel free to step on inside. I promise not to shut this in front of you. Okay, go ahead. No, really, go inside. <laughs> okay, you get that end, Dick. I get the other end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. Yeah, you guys could literally pick this thing up, probably. Now, it doesn't look big from the outside. Yeah. <laughs> I just broke it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just keep your head down low. 
<laughs> so let me get in here as well. See, all Gosh, of us. It's huge. Yeah, it looks pretty good in here. So uh, we did have, uh, before the frame was built, we did have um, some people out here and they made a little fire. You can see that he's got a war club. And the only reason those things are still there because they're wired down. Mm, yeah. yeah, the public could just pick them up and take them. Sure. So, but uh, it would have taken, it took the guy only eight hours basically to make the frame itself and a few more hours just to put all this stuff up together. And what they would do is they would strip the bark predominantly. Now we used wire, but they would strip the bark off and use it for the lashing. And that would last, again, Shawnee Hunter's Lodge, you're talking three to four weeks. And so the lashing would be more than enough just by using the bark itself. So, I know this is a little bit more than probably what you figured you'd get today, but... This is wow. cool. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but any other questions? If not, again, it's an honor and a privilege to talk to an audience whose height is greater than three foot two. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. So, uh, and uh, Professor Shields has my contact information. If you have questions or anything else like that, just give me a holler. So, Terrific. all right. We'll I'm see you here. Monday. All right. Yep, Monday at uh, 10 o'clock. Linda's yep. still coming with me, so. Very cool. Okay. Yep. I've uh, I've been gone over the last week, mm. so uh, um, uh, turkey season. Uh -huh. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. So, but I've got a couple hundred emails I got to go through. I, I know understand. somebody had <coughs> contacted me about uh, mileage. I don't know who it was. A carpenter who works for us. Okay, but I'll so get that taken care of over the weekend. That's terrific. So. All right, guys. Okay. Y'all take care.